One of the questions I get when I teach inductive Bible study is uh, the honest question about the validity of looking for structural relationships in a piece of literature. Uh, in inductive Bible study, we look for things like comparisons, contrasts, uh, cause and effect, effect to cause, uh, structures like particularization, generalization, and there's several other structures that we look for. And th but the question ends up being, are those categories that we impose from, say, a Western 21st century perspective on ancient literature, are they really there? And then there's a related question. Do authors really intend for these structures to exist? Are they conscious or really um, unconscious? Um, let me answer that uh, briefly. Um, I believe personally that the structures are part of the way that human language has developed. Again, you, there's different ways of describing the structures, but these seem to be uh, things that work across cultures. So it's not simply um, Westerners finding these and then imposing them on ancient languages where they wouldn't have been there. They seem to actually be categories that are helpful. And this makes sense. So I think it's part of our neuro uh, the way that our brains function that we use certain patterns to actually communicate ideas. And we learn those things. Which then leads to the second one, did the ancient authors actually intend to embed these structures in their, liter in their literature? Well, you can answer that in two ways. I think sometimes the answer is yes. Now, one of the things that we have to remember is that biblical texts were written to be performed out loud. Most people were not literate, so if the text was going to be heard by most people, it was going to be through their ears. So I think we have to assume that texts that are performed orally, it's, we're not going to be surprised to find things like recurrences that you can pick up with your ears or certain structures that are more rhetorical, uh, chiasms, repeated patterns that, again, in an oral culture, you can pick up. So different forms of repetition that help us to hear things. Uh, I think also certain structures can be embedded um, by authors. I know myself, and just from listening to enough people who, who, who are writers, a lot of writing is you just are creating literature, but then at some point you go back and you organize your thoughts, you make sure it's coherent, and sometimes you even go back and put in like things like foreshadowing and stuff to help the reader understand the story as it develops. So we have to assume that in the biblical literature that we have, that care has been taken in terms of the sequence, the order that things are put in, that that's intentional by the author. Now, can something happen unintentionally and be fantastic? Yes, but again, it works because it fits into the patterns of the way that humans communicate. Now, on another level, is it possible that some of these things are unconscious? And the answer, again, is going to be yes, for the same reason. Um, the way that we put words together in different languages, again, I'm speaking English, but this works in Spanish, uh, this works in Russian literature, this seems to work for sure in Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic. I'm not going to make an argument for languages that I don't know anything about, but I, there's enough languages that I just mentioned that are different types of languages that these structures clearly work in and show up in that I think we then can infer, at least as a hypothesis, that this is more about the way that the human brain works and organizes things linguistically, that we can say that with some confidence that we're going to see this in most languages. So I hope this answers the question. Again, if you want to push back or ask questions, you can raise that with me uh, directly in class. But I, I'm under the assumption that the, the search for structures is completely valid uh, um, as long as you have evidence in the text that supports the arguments that we make for the structures.